Hey everybody, and here we go with our third video for chapter 28, which is on section 4, uh, the Soviet Union under Stalin. So in chapter 26, we learned about the Russian Revolution and how the Tsar was overthrown and the Russian Empire was turned into the communist state called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the USSR. It was often called the Soviet Union. USSR and Soviet Union mean the same thing. Okay, so USSR, Soviet Union, same thing. Okay, so if you hear me refer to him, I'm referring to the same thing. Now, the USSR started with Vladimir Lenin, but Lenin didn't create a true totalitarian state. That would be accomplished by the man who took over after Lenin died, Joseph Stalin. Now, Stalin may have taken over after Lenin, but it's important to know that he was not Lenin's chosen successor. All right, the picture here of Lenin, remember Lenin with his bald head and goatee, and Stalin there on the right. That was actually one of the few pictures they have of the two of them together. Uh, during the days of the revolution, civil, uh, the civil war that followed, Stalin was not even a particularly high-ranking member of the Bolsheviks. Uh, the guy who really was Lenin's right-hand man and who was the leader of the Red Army was this guy, Leon Trotsky. So this begs the question, how did a mid-ranking party member become the supreme leader of the largest country in the world? Well, there are a couple of things. He did so by winning key ally, ally, uh, allies in the Communist Party. Uh, what Stalin lacked in inspirational leadership, he made up for it with ruthlessness and cunning. He knew how to maneuver both his allies and enemies and was ruthless enough to have anyone who stood in his way eliminated. And that was something that Trotsky really, um, I guess, underestimated about Stalin. He looked at Stalin as being very mediocre. He didn't have the attributes to be this inspirational wartime leader. But behind the scenes, Stalin was accumulating power and support. And once Lenin died, he was ready to make his move. So by 1924, Stalin had taken out or driven off all of his competition, including Trotsky. Trotsky was driven into exile after Stalin came to power, and he stood at the head of the Soviet Union. Stalin set out to transform Soviet society, and he transformed the Soviet economy into what we call a command economy. A command economy is one where the govern, government makes all decisions, both big and small. So everything from which items will be manufactured in factories to how much those items will cost in stores is all decided by the government. Government handles all of that. It's the opposite of laissez-faire economy where government has no involvement whatsoever. So make sure you remember that command economy is the opposite of laissez-faire. To achieve his goals, Stalin implemented what are called five-year plans. And during these, and obviously they were over five years, he set goals for both agriculture and industry, right? The two of them together, you see the farmer and the industrial worker shaking hands. Um, and in terms of industry, though, the results were mixed. Uh, government officials pushed factory managers to meet goals, and they also punished those that didn't meet the goals. However, uh, you know, it wasn't all good. Overall, production did increase significantly, but it did not see any real impact on the quality of life for the average Soviet citizens. Wages were still low, you know, you still had a lot of poor workers, and most importantly, not enough consumer products like clothes and cars were being made. The government didn't care about that stuff. They wanted the big stuff, uh, but meanwhile, the people didn't have enough fine clothes or even cars to drive. Agriculture was a different story. Uh, for this, Stalin implemented a policy known as collectivization. Now, collectivization is where peasants are forced to give up their individually owned smaller farms to the government. The government would then combine these smaller farms into what are called collectives. Now, these were large state-owned farms, and you'd have hundreds if not thousands of peasants working on them all at the same time. The government provided all the resources, such as seed, fertilizer, tractors, even the animals. Now, the flip side of this is that nothing was actually owned by the farmers themselves. Homes and personal belongings were the only things not turned over to the collective. And as you can imagine, there was a fair amount of peasant resistance to the collectivization. Most peasants didn't want to give up their land. Uh, and they also, uh, they didn't like the idea of having it kind of, if they were successful, of having that spread out. Uh, wealthy farmers, and particularly known as kulaks, let's see if I can put this on there. Okay, there's a group of kulaks uh, demonstrating here. They resisted by burning crops and destroying equipment. Stalin's response to this was brutal. Thousands of peasants were driven from their lands and forced to labor camps. Many of them were killed or died of overworking. Overall, collectivization led to severe food shortages. Peasants began growing just enough to feed themselves, but in response, the government seized the land for industrial workers, leaving the peasants to starve. This policy, combined with poor harvest, resulted in widespread famine and millions of deaths. 
So while the results of Stalin's five-year plans did result in some positive industrial results, overall the agriculture results were a disaster. Now, when talking about collectivization, we discussed how Stalin could respond with brutal ruthlessness. This was also exemplified in his use of terror. Stalin used fear and terror as a weapon to maintain control. He made wide use of secret police to spy on people. There was no freedom of speech or the press, and any criticism of Stalin was met with swift punishment. Remember the example of uh, the example of Alexander Solzhenitsyn that we talked about in discussing what totalitarian rule is? He was a writer, but he wasn't arrested for writing an essay criticizing Stalin. He criticized Stalin in a private letter to a friend. Police regularly read private mail, and people could be imprisoned for what they wrote in it. For this crime, Solzhenitsyn was sent to a gulag. Gulags were labor camps. Most of them were in Siberia or northern Russia. Many people sent to the gulags died, either from starvation, disease, or simply being overworked in the freezing cold. Stalin's paranoia was most notoriously demonstrated in the period known as the Great Purge, which lasted from 1936 to 1938. During the first decade of his rule, Stalin grew increasingly paranoid that old members of the Bolshevik party would threaten his power. These were people who had actually served in the Russian Revolution and the Civil War and could speak out against his rewriting of history that he was Lenin's right-hand man. Eventually, he had his police also arresting military leaders, industrial managers, writers, anyone who he deemed a threat to his absolute control. They were given show trials where the verdict was already determined, and many were tortured into confessing crimes they didn't commit. After they were found guilty, they were either shipped off to the gulags to be worked to death, like we see here in these pictures, or they were simply executed outright. All total, some 4 million people were purged from Soviet society during Stalin's reign. As a result of the purges, Stalin increased his power, but at a cost. As we said before, a lot of these guys were military and industrial leaders. The military loss in particular, that would be especially bad when war breaks out with Germany a few years later. Now, one of the key characteristics of a totalitarian state is the government control of the hearts and minds of the people. And Stalin sought to do that as well. So let's talk about this government control. A big aspect of government control is propaganda, and propaganda was used extensively. Propaganda can be used to uh, both boost morale and also to essentially brainwash the people into believing what you want. Stalin used it for both. He used propaganda to build what's called a cult of personality around himself. This is when a leader makes himself into an almost godlike figure. Stalin actually kind of tried to create a dual-sided image of himself. On one side, he was Papa Stalin. That was a nickname that he cultivated amongst the people, that he was this loving father figure that we see in this picture. And on the other side to it, he was this almost godlike figure, standing above everybody, leaving the Soviet Union to greatness throughout the world. Uh, Soviet propaganda was in theaters, it was in schools, it was on the radio, it was in street posters. Something that is often associated with propaganda is censorship of the arts. Stalin wanted all artistic expression to conform to Soviet standards, and this was strictly enforced. The government controlled what books were published, what music was heard, and what art was displayed. Stalin forced artists to create works in a style called socialist realism, which was designed to show Soviet life in a positive light, such as these women going off to work in the fields, right, inspiring other people, even women, to contribute. We'll actually talk a little bit more about women's contribution to Soviet society in a minute. Uh, The flip side of it, though, if artists or writers refused to conform, they were punished, right, off to the gulags they go. The Communist Party also engaged in a war on religion. Now, in regards to religion, the official policy is atheism right atheism is a belief that there is no god there is no higher power or anything like that Uh, this followed the writings of Karl Marx who called religion the opiate of the masses meaning there was a drug for the people the Russian Orthodox Church was the biggest target but other Christian groups and Jews were persecuted as well this is a Soviet poster saying that they should get rid of all religious holidays so here you see a tie-in of propaganda with the war on religion Um, They also, the Communist Party believed that they could get rid of all of these previous religions because they wanted to make themselves into this new religion with its own sacred texts and its own holy figures, uh, namely Stalin, Marx, and uh, Lenin. Here you see again Stalin, this cult of personality, and then Lenin behind him, this almost godlike figure, and they're leading the people to greatness and so forth. All right, now let's talk about the last part here with Soviet society. Stalin's vision of communism, version of communism, turned out to be very different from the communism first envisioned by Marx and even later by Lenin. 
Marx envisioned communism as a classless society where everyone shared equally in the wealth of production. Stalin, though, through his use of terror and propaganda, had turned it into a totalitarian state. Instead of the wealthy landowners or wealthy business owners being at the top of society, the Communist Party made up the new elite. Now, only a small number of people could actually join the party, and you had to be a member of the party to have any type of status in the Soviet Union. They lived in the best homes, had access to goods regular people didn't, and they lived a much higher standard of living. On the flip side, though, Stalin's purges usually targeted members of the elite, and so all those people that were being shipped off that he was paranoid about, they typically fell within this category. Now, Soviet society did have some benefits. A big one being free education for both boys and girls. It was free because it was provided by the government. The Soviet Union wanted to expand as an industrial power and believed it needed to educate its youth in technology in order to do so. Schools also served as a means to teach communist values to children at a young age. In addition to this, you had free government-funded programs such as medical care, uh, daycare to take care of kids for workers, uh, uh, housing, okay, public housing. You know, we almost think of these as like an early form of housing projects that we have in the United States, and also some public re uh, recreation facilities. Now, with these benefits, there were some significant drawbacks. The state may have provided a lot of services, but they usually were of a poor quality. That's always one of the criticisms of socialism or communism, even to this day, that they negatively impact the quality of services such as health care. Right? If the quantity goes up, quality tends to go down. Another drawback is that only necessities were provided and there were very few luxuries. Remember, the Soviet economy was a command economy where the government makes all decisions. The Soviet government chose not to focus on the production of luxury items like fancy clothes and electronics, and so therefore they were in very short supply. Food as well. You know, bread was very plentiful, but meat, fresh fruit, tough time finding that type of stuff. One area of society that Soviet communism must be given credit for improvement, though, was the status of women. As I said before, girls were given access to education, right? You see up here. Uh, but they were also encouraged to work in order to better serve the state, right? So propaganda about this. Now, obviously, a lot of this is wartime propaganda during World War II, but still, women are encouraged to participate in society. They worked not only in factories and the fields, but also in areas even such as medicine and engineering. Also during World War II, this is something that you did not see in, the, in countries like the United States. Soviet women actively contributed in combat. Now, it was still a male-dominated world, but they did see an improvement in the Soviet Union compared to many other nations at the time. All right, so there's an overview of what life was like in the Soviet Union under Stalin, and then we will finish up with the last video in this section, and we talk about Nazi Germany.